Father, thank you for um, just thank you for the the words and the testimony that you've built in my own life and the life of my family um, and in the life of this church. I pray that you would be with us this morning as we share some principles from Scripture. I pray that you would give me the the right words to say that it would be effective, that you would use this to stir um, a passion up in other people uh, for the things that we're going to be talking about. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, the, The reason I do that, and kind of this morning weighs a little more heavy on me, is because I'm going to be talking about something that I don't talk about enough and something I think some churches talk about too much. At least that's the criticism that the world has, and that's the topic of personal finance, um, money. Um, I haven't done a series on money since November of 2017, and that's, that's too little um, compared to how much Jesus talked about money and compared to the New Testament teaching on money and the Old Testament teaching on how we handle our finances. And the, today I wanted to wait for this specific Sunday. The Lord providentially worked it out where I could share this story with you and this this testimony with you in victory. Um, Because just this week, uh, after 18 months of working hard at it, Lisa and I became completely debt-free minus our mortgage. Um, And I say that because, to be honest with you, 18 months ago when we started this journey, I was a little embarrassed by the debt that we had accumulated. And part of that was out of our control um, to some degree, but a large part of it was very well within our control. And we were living a little bit outside of our means. You know, from the time we were married, we were very serious about how we handled our money. Um, We came into marriage quite a bit in debt. I had just graduated college literally the week before our wedding day. Um, And I had over 40 some thousand dollars in student loans. Um, which led me to join the Army to erase all of that. And the Army completely, graciously, um, your tax dollars paid for my education, so thank you. I appreciate (laughs) appreciate that. Um, But the Army paid off all my loans. But we went into that. I had a a Jeep Wrangler at the time that I bought used. Never bought a a brand-new car. We don't have any of this grandiose lifestyle. Like, that's just not us. But I had a loan on a personal vehicle, a Jeep Wrangler. Lisa had a loan on a Saturn. And so we had over about 60 grand in debt coming into marriage, and that didn't sit well with me. Uh, my undergrad was in personal finance and accounting, um, so I knew up here uh, how to handle money really well, and I could teach you and coach you about how to handle your money really well. Um, but I was coming into this marriage strapped in debt, and so that led to the decision to join the military. Um, by God's grace and providence, I say that now because on the, on the, when it was happening, it was really difficult, but I deployed uh, to Iraq, and during that time, you get a little bit of extra pay being in hazardous duty, and uh, just didn't spend any money, so really attacked it. Man, the Army paid off my loans. I paid off our car loans. We were able to save a lot of money, um, but something happened. So for 10 years of our marriage, I'll say the first 10 years, we came in that way. By the time I left active duty, we were debt-free and had a, a good, sizable reserve fund um, in place. Um, But over the course of our time in Ohio, when we went back home, I was no longer on active duty. We weren't making as much money. Um, I began to, uh, well, we made some decisions to give away a lot of our reserve fund. Um, It was just things that the Lord put on our heart to help some family members and to do some things. Um, We depleted our reserve fund. Um, And in that, we felt like that was still driven by the Lord. But where we lacked wisdom was we didn't replenish it. And we didn't save any more money. So we were living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and then inevitably, right, the world says Murphy, Murphy's Law kind of kicks in and our vehicle kind of blew up, uh, the van that we were driving, uh, right around the time we were transitioning here. Um, and so here we are, uh, we're not in debt at all, but we have uh, to get a vehicle and we didn't have any money saved up to do it. So we, against our better judgment, took out a loan and got a vehicle, not a brand new one, um, but it still required us to take out a loan to get the van that we did. Um, and then something else happened that, uh, that I wish I would have been better prepared for, and that was when my tax status changed, when I fully got ordained and came here and, and began to pay taxes as a, as a pastor. Um, a lot of people are confused about that, um, but pastors, ministers, um, have to file self-employment taxes, which means I have to pay over 
percent of my annual package um, to the government if I want to have Social Security because we don't pay Social Security throughout the year. Well, for us, the first time that that happened, again, we weren't prepared for that because well, over the course of our marriage, we'd been getting returns at tax season, quite sizable returns. But instead of getting a return the first year, we ended up having to pay five, six thousand dollars that we didn't have. And so what did I do? We had no emergency fund. It went on a credit card. And so it began, right? And so there was, they, they say that handling your finances is only about 20% knowledge and 80% behavior. And I found that to be true over the last year and a half because even having accumulated the debt of those things that were a little bit out of our circumstance or just we weren't prudent enough to prepare for, um, we still kept eating out too much and we still kept spending more money than we had. And so we had gotten to the position where we were about 21,000 in debt counting the cars and the credit cards. And that was really embarrassing for me um, to the point where I felt a, a little bit of shame, felt a little bit of guilt. Um, all through that, I will say that we never stopped giving. We gave faithfully, continued to tithe 10% of our income. We've always done that from the time that we got married to the local church um, because we believe that uh, as, as a Christian, we're, we have that responsibility to help fund the ministry of which we are a part and of which we benefit from. So we were giving, giving but what we weren't doing was managing well the other 90. And that's the title of today's message. The other 90% of our income. So even being in debt, we're giving faithfully, giving faithfully to the church, but all the while not managing well the other 90% of our income. And so what I'm going to share with you today is a little bit of our journey um, and some things that I had to wrestle with and come to grips with personally some truths of Scripture that now have hopefully continue to shape and guide me and guide us as a church and you as individuals um, because it's God's Word. And so we want to be able to steward well the things that God has blessed us with. And so before I do that, I have to answer the question of what happened. Like what happened 18 months ago that put us on this journey that, that kind of drew a line in the sand. And that was when we just got to the point where we were sick and tired of kind of living paycheck to paycheck, not gaining any ground financially. Um, and honestly, I was just tired of the, the weight of debt. And, and some of you might be sitting there today and you're like, man, my debt is, is not even close to that. Or some of you might be sitting there on the opposite end thinking, man, I got way more debt than what you're talking about. And the reality is that statistically in this room, normal for Americans today is to be strapped with debt, unfortunately. They say that the average person today, average household has over 4,000 in credit card debt, massive student loans, depending on your age range. Um, a lot of debt characterized. And I, had, I have a bunch of statistics. I don't even feel like I need to burden you with that um, because it's just the reality, and you guys know this to be true, uh, that America tends to be very consumer-driven and live well outside of our means. Um, and so... 18 months ago, this church ran a course, Financial Peace. Uh, it's a Dave Ramsey course. We've continued to do that year in and year out. And I just stand before you today to say that if you follow that, it works. Like, it, it works. Um, we went from having $21,000 in debt to being debt-free this week. We made that final payment, and I can't tell you the shackles, the, the freedom that I now feel in um, being able to stand before you today with, with no shame, but with a testimony to say, uh, I know some of you guys are strapped and you need help, um, and this church wants to come alongside of you. Uh, we, we run this course annually. Um, I encourage you to do it, really encourage you to do it, because the point is not for us to be wealthy. It's us to um, have wealth in order to further like our interests, God's interests in this world, and to, to do better by our families and to not strap our kids with debt, to be able to get our kids through college without taking on that huge amount of debt and loans and all of those things. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through uh, what I had to wrestle with theologically in my mind over the last 18 months. And it begins 
with God. Everything begins with Him, right? And Psalm 24 is the first one. And this is the first truth. I'm going to give you six things that I had to personally wrestle with. And I think that it would be good for you to wrestle with as well. And number one is the truth that God owns everything. Amen. Like, I, somehow in, in the justification of my mind, like, we were giving 10% to God. Because, that, you know, as we say in the church, we give a portion of what God gives us back to God. But the reality is, and the scriptural truth is, God owns everything. We don't give back to Him you know, just in, in our giving to the church. But everything that we have, including our very selves, belong to God. Listen to this scripture. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, meaning the fullness of everything in the earth is the Lord's. He is the owner. He is the creator. He is master of all. The world, it says, and those who dwell therein. Do you dwell in this world? Some of you are like, I don't know, man. <laughs> yes, right? And so when you, you, you're a part of God's creation, you're His. And recognizing this simple truth that everything is God, not just 10% of what I get and then the rest is mine, but 100% of who I am and what I have is God's. And I want, to, I want that to be at His disposal, that I could follow His will, and, and, and I said this earlier, but the reason we, we do this and the reason we manage our finances well is not so that we can build a name or status for ourselves, uh, but rather that we would be able to give generously, that we would be able to love people and help people, serve people, bless our families, right? It's, it's a blessing to leave an inheritance to our children and to our grandchildren. I want, I want that kind of legacy. Um, but it begins with the fundamental truth that all that we have belongs to God. He's our master. He is our creator. He owns everything, not just 10%. He's not just entitled to 10% a tithe, but rather 100% of what we have is a gift from God that we are to manage well, to steward according to His wisdom. Amen. Second thing I had to wrestle with is this. My ability... To produce wealth comes from God. And so we can, we can make these arguments like, yeah, this is my money. I want to do what I want with it. I'll give God His portion, but the rest of it, I, can, I do whatever I want with it, right? Or, or we can think that we worked hard for this. We deserve this. We're entitled to this. I'm a, I'm a self-made man or wh whatever spin you put on it. But the reality is that even our very faculties, like our mental faculties, our physical faculties, all that we have is a gift from God. and can be taken away from us in a moment. And so Scripture says in Deuteronomy 8, this very truth, verse 17 to 18, the first part of it says this, Beware, that's a warning, Beware, lest you say in your heart that my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Right? To be puffed up, to be prideful, because maybe you're in better standing than someone else. He says, beware lest you say that in your heart. Why? And he gives us the reason in verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. The very resources we have, our human resources, our gifts, our abilities, our intelligence, our physical you know, prowess that makes us labor if you work with your hands more, Whatever it is, it all is a gift from God. And so I had to wrestle with that. Like my ability is to, to produce, to work, to make money comes from the Lord. And therefore it adds to this conviction that everything belongs to Him. And that all that I have is because of Him. And I want to live in light of that truth. I want to honor Him with my wealth. The third thing I had to wrestle with is you can't serve two masters. I cannot serve two masters. And Scripture puts these two things up together, not God and the devil, as, as these polar opposites, but God and money as the two things that most covet your heart. God wants your heart. Money, the love of money is what? The root of all kinds of evil, the Bible says. 
It's after your heart. And so there is a, a world and a system and uh, spiritual forces, I would even say, that are at play in, in gripping your heart and making an idol of money because that leads to all kinds of other evils and forms of idolatry. So, cannot serve both. And this is what Jesus said from His mouth. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Those things are opposed in, in terms of the, the implications for your heart. Money serves us, right? And so that's the flip side. If, you, if we recognize that God is our master, then money becomes not, not a servant or another master to us, but, but rather it, it serves our purposes, which are nested under the purposes of God. So it becomes a resource, a tool for us to advance God's kingdom in this world. And that it would be a, a mighty, powerful tool, not a master. And so wrestling with that is something you have to do. Are you, are you mastered by money? Is, is money driving you to make the bulk of decisions that you're making in your life? And that leads into this fourth thing to wrestle with. And that is that debt, personal debt, enslaves me. I was feeling the shackles of personal debt. Debt enslaves us. Proverbs 22, 7. This is something repeated all throughout the financial peace course. The rich rules over the poor. And this is the emphasized part. The borrower is what? Slave to the lender. It enslaves us to be strapped with debt. Why? Because the choices and the freedom to do and choose and, and tell our money where to go is no longer ours when we owe a car payment, a credit card payment, a student loan payment, whatever other kind of consumer debt we've, personal loans, different things that we've taken out. That means you are no longer master of your money, that you have now become its servant. And so it's telling you, the lender is telling you where your money should go and has to go legally. Right? And, and I don't know if you've ever felt that, and maybe some of you, like, this is just not connecting, but to feel the entrapment of being strapped with debt, to know that, like, when that paycheck comes in, it's automatically going to this, something I bought five years ago or ten years ago, or something that might not even be working anymore, or, or some bad decision we made in the past to take on this obligation, spending money that we didn't have for whatever reason. And there's a number of reasons that people stay in debt. Matter of fact, I'll give you 10 of them quickly from, from a, a blog from Financial Peace. 10 reasons people stay in debt. Number one, they want to keep up appearances. One of the reasons people stay in debt, one of the top reasons, is simply because your friends are going out to eat and you want to go with them. Um, your friends are going on these exotic vacations and you're looking at Instagram and you're like, I, I wish I could do that. I want to be in Costa Rica. I want to be in Japan. I want to be wherever. It looks so exotic. looks so lovely. I want to do that. I don't have the money to do it, but I got a credit card. $4,000 on vacation. Or it could be something simpler, something that you can even justify because it's something you actually need, not just a vacation, but something like a vehicle need a vehicle. So you want one that's reliable, so you, you think you have to borrow the money. Well, the reality is new cars even break down. <laughs> cars that you make in $500 a month car payments for can still break down on you. And so there are ways to navigate this and, and, and real coaching and real help to help you live in such a way and, and be able to live debt-free in such a way um, that you're not a slave to this, driven by a desire to impress other people. Right? So we care far too much what other people think about us. Sometimes it's just laziness on our part. That's the number one reason. People stay in debt. Number two, people stay in debt because they don't think they make enough money. Most of the time, it's not someone's salary that's the problem. Like I said earlier, it's 
their behavior. 80% of this has to do with our behavior. Spending more money than you make will cause you to stay in debt. You can't get out of debt by continuing to spend more money than you make. That's why it's so important, so practical to get on a budget. I mean, I hope that when we walk away today, that some of you walk away with some conviction. Like, I need to do something about this in my life. Because until you get to that point, until you get to this place where you're like, I've had enough of this, you're not going to have the focus and the determination over the long haul that it takes to break free from this master called debt. To break free from your slave to the lender. Number three, unwilling to sacrifice How could you possibly give up eating out four times a week? What would your life look like without direct TV or Cox Cable? You'll never know until you're willing to give something up in order to build a legacy and an inheritance for your children and your children's children. And the Bible calls that wisdom. It takes wisdom to do that. If you're in debt, the reality is, Something in your lifestyle has to change. And we got to that place where we're like, we have to change our behavior because it's not an issue of income. Most of the time, it's not. Now, trust me, I know what it's like to struggle. I, I grew up in a home where financial resources were always extended, <laughs> like always strapped, always difficult. I, I shared a bedroom with my sister most of my life because we never in a three-bedroom house. Like I just, I know what it's like to struggle financially, but I also know what it's like to mismanage because my parents, looking back, made plenty enough money for us to, to be comfortable middle-class Americans, but rather did not manage it well. They were unwilling to sacrifice, and some of you have been unwilling to sacrifice in order to tackle this monster. Which leads, number four, another reason, they have no hope. When you're buried in $1,000 of debt, it's easy to feel like there's no way out. And that's why in the financial peace course, they, they teach you to tackle the small things first. They do have the debt snowball plan where you're tackling the little things so you can gain momentum. And just like a snowball, when you roll it down a hill, it's gradually picking up more and more flakes. It's gradually getting bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. And so it is when you take all of your debts and you list them out and you begin to tackle them, the smallest first. Because when you get that win, when you can celebrate, I paid off this $1,000 credit card, then you got this next $4,000 thing, and you got now money that you were given to there that you can put here, and all of a sudden you got more room to make bigger payments. And that snowball is becoming larger and larger, and you can do this. You can do this. Number five, people are just addicted to stuff. Like, we let our stuff, our toys, the things that bring us joy, um, dictate our lifestyle because it is an addiction. You know, our culture has really twisted what it means to be able to to afford something. You know, it used to be that if you had the money in your checking account, you could afford it and you could buy it. Now that's no longer required in people's minds. If you have enough room on your credit card to put it on there, then you can afford it. Or if I can afford the minimum payment, this $400, $500 a month car payment, I can fit that into my budget, then we convince ourselves that we can actually afford something. But unless you can walk up to somebody and hand them the money, you're spending more than you have. You cannot afford that at that moment. And that's a cultural mindset that we have to break free from. Because all that does is keep extending the debt that we have and obligating ourselves through, through indentured servanthood to slavery to the lender to continue to make those payments, to, comp- to continue to strap ourselves in positions that are really unhealthy for us. And it doesn't take into account the fact that it is God who has given us the ability to produce wealth, and there are times when God takes that ability away. You can lose your job. You can get in an accident. There's, there's so many things. So when you're taking on something that's going to take you five years to pay off, you don't have any clue what's going to happen in the next year. You don't have any clue what's going to happen in the next 
day. Number six, we don't make it a priority. Sometimes we think if we can just make the minimum payments, it's not a priority to get out of debt. And it's until that becomes a conviction, until it becomes a priority, where we're thinking more about our children and our children's children. And we're thinking about our ministry and and being able to resource God's church and His kingdom to, to be most passionate about what's most important in this world and not live paycheck to paycheck, then we will never get out of it. Number seven, and this one's hard for some of you, People stay in debt because their husband and wife are not on the same page. In every marriage, inevitably, God has a sense of humor and He puts a saver with a spender. And and those of you laughing right now know you're the spenders. And those of you angry right now know that it's your spouse that's the spender and you're the saver and you're wanting them to stop spending so much money on entertainment or on whatever so that you can accomplish your goals. But the reality is that until husband and wife work together and get on the same page, your priorities are mismatched. You'll have different goals. It takes a team, right? And so one of the things, one of the benefits, and I say this, man, just wholeheartedly as an endorsement on my part, that when you get after this stuff together, when you really get after it, I mean, you're on the same page, you have conviction about your why. Why are we doing this? Why do we have to get this together? Why do we have to think about this now instead of putting it off till we're living in retirement and Social Security, counting on that, which may or may not be there by the time you get there? Then, you, then you're, 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 <laughs> it's a struggle. But the benefit of doing this and getting after it together um, is that it becomes unto you marriage counseling. <laughs> I can't tell you, and, and they'll say this in the course if you take financial peace, that A lot of people do it to get out of debt and to manage their money well. But the communication skills that it takes to work at this together as a couple are the same communication skills it takes for you to succeed in your marriage. You begin communicating better. When you sit down to do a budget together, your values begin to line up together. and You begin to manage things and you have common goals. You begin to work as a team. And the added benefit of of being that team is that your marriage is strengthened far beyond what you'd expect. And in, in the simple act of, you know what, let's do this. Let's, let's work at our finances personally together. Number eight, people just aren't managing their money. Only 41% of Americans follow a budget, and I think that's a generous statistic. That was based on a poll in 2015. That was four years ago. I don't know what the number is now. But it says roughly 41% of Americans actually have a budget and follow it. I think that's a generous statistic. Number nine, um, people won't cut up their credit cards. When you're unwilling to part ways with a credit card, that's always your emergency fund. And that's the same thing that happened to us. Uh, We weren't overspending. We just got in a situation where we had no emergency fund. So what did we turn to for our emergency? A credit card to money we don't actually have. A credit card is nothing but a very, very poor, high-interest personal loan. It is not money that you have at your possession. It is the number one cause of continued compiling, compounding debt. Lastly, number 10, sometimes people just don't know how. Like you just, uh, I said it's only 20% knowledge, but it, there is some knowledge to this that it takes some skills and some, some baseline things to, to begin to work this out. And that's why at the church, like we really want to help our families with this. We know how important that, th- that this is for your marriage, for your future, to be able to really do this. And so we offer financial peace at least once a year. And we've done it twice on occasion. Um, we're going to be working out the next dates for that really soon. And we'll let you know that. Um, but on top of that, right now we're currently in, in one of our core seminars teaching on stewardship. Now stewardship is a broader category that doesn't only apply to your personal finances, but it's still managing the things that God has given you well. So I'd encourage you to jump in that also. The fifth thing that I had to wrestle with personally is that the way I view stuff reveals what's in my heart. And this is probably the most gut-wrenching scripture that I'm going to put up there today. And we know it's so true. These are Jesus' words. 
He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's almost cliche for a pastor to stand before his congregation and say, let me look at your calendar, let me look at your checkbook, and I'll be able to tell you what's most important to you. But it's true. How are you spending your time? How are you spending your money? Reveals largely what's most important to you in your life. You know when Jesus said this, the occasion that prompted it, He had just told His disciples not to store up for themselves treasures on earth where thieves and rust destroy, where thieves steal and rust takes, you know, destroys, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven. He's saying that the kingdom is a worthy investment. Where we, where we steward our money, that, that where we funnel our finances, largely reveals what's in our heart. For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. And if I had to come to grips with this personally, then I would have to say that while almost just out of simple obedience, I, we would continue to give you know, a tithe to the church um, personally. The other 90 for us probably revealed more what was going on in my heart. Um, and the reality is I could buy a new surfboard every week if Lisa would let me. And I had to repent of that, like just in my own heart of like, what's really important to you? Why would you, what, don't, what are you going to spend your money on? What are you going to do? Vacations, th- things like that. Things that, that are really important and, and good, not inherently bad in and of themselves, but still may reveal a bit of idolatry on our part, if not full-blown idolatry. And so to wrestle with this question, man, I, I put it back on you because I'm, this is my cathartic moment of confession and repentance before the church. But for you to think, like, what, what is really in your heart? There is, and, and, I mean, we'll do a, a financial update tonight during our town hall gathering. Um, and we're doing okay as a church, but man, we could really be doing so much better if our hearts were really in this together. And so the question is, where's your treasure? I hope that you would take a moment to reflect on that before we wrap up. Number six, the final thing that I had to wrestle with is just, I needed a plan. I needed a way forward. And I needed some accountability. We needed some accountability. I needed the accountability of my wife. She needed the accountability of me. We needed the accountability of our brothers and sisters in the church. And so going through the class together in a group like we did provided that structure. Um, Larry Ebinger is one of our elders here, and he, he's the one that taught the first course. He led that. He facilitated that. And all throughout um, that course and in the last 18 months, I've checked in with him regularly. Like, brother, we're still after it. We're still getting after it. It's hard, and there's setbacks, right? Because my car keeps breaking down. <laughs> but there's, there's, we're still getting after it. And that provided some accountability for me because the facilitator of my class knew where we started. He knew our goal, and he knew we were after it. And I willingly submitted myself to that process in our family. And we have people in here that love you and are very gifted in these areas and are willing to meet with you, to counsel with you, to provide some accountability for you. But it doesn't happen without a plan. And I think that there is a very simple plan uh, that we followed, a um, very simple plan that's taught uh, by Ramsey Solutions. It doesn't have to be their plan, but it's a very good one. And it's got a proven track record for working. And in order to be in a better position to really break free, to, be, to have financial peace, you need a plan because you don't drift towards obedience in these areas. We drift away from obedience. And that's true in every area of our lives, right? It's true physically in our bodies, right? We don't drift towards six-pack abs. We drift away from that physically. Like it drifts away from you. (laughs) We try to do that. You know what I'm talking about? Without obedience, without a plan, it doesn't work. Uh, the same with our finances, right? Without a plan, it's not going to work. You're going to continue to dig yourself into more and more of a hole. And I'm just saying that, you know, as a church, like we can't be afraid to talk about these things, um, especially as a leader. I felt, I felt some embarrassment that came along with that. But now I just feel like, man, God has um, really helped me in this area. 
um, through the brothers and sisters in this church. And God can help you in that. And I, my heart is just broken uh, for young families who are strapped with debt. I deal with this. 75% of my counseling in the military has to do with personal finances. Um, because we continue to spend money that we don't have. And I didn't put this in your notes, but I would add one final thing to this. Number seven. That God wants us to be wise and be generous with our money. And that's ultimately the conviction that led me to do something about it. That I wasn't exercising wisdom in the other 90. Faithful with that 10%. Check comes, write that tithe check, give to the church. Not faithful with the other 90, not wise. And so understanding that the Lord wants me to be wise in that area, that it's all His anyways. And two, He wants me to be generous. And when there's people that I want to help but can't help because I don't have the resources to do so, it breaks my heart. I want to be in a place where, you know, even though they didn't make very much money, that Lisa's grandparents were in. Lisa's grandparents have both passed on. But I can't tell you how many times early in our marriage they blessed us with an unexpected gift. Um, just out of nowhere, the Lord would provide something through them um, that would just capture our hearts and bring us to tears of their faithfulness and the way that they were able to be so generous because they were willing to sacrifice themselves how they handled their money. And I don't know about you, but I just I want to be that old grandpa someday where when Malachi's kids are little, I want to give them gifts. I want to be able to shower them, not in a worldly way, but just to show them that I love them, that I want to bless them, that I want to bless my children, my children's children. I want to leave them, not with a legacy of debt because of me, but with a true inheritance. It's a blessing from the Lord. Would you bow your head and pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I pray that You would take what was shared today and to stir up in us um, some conviction in our lives. You know, we work hard. Many people in this room work very hard for what they have. We humbly submit that it's You that gives us the ability to do that. So people in this room have great financial resources. We humbly submit that those too are Yours. Some people in this room are living paycheck to paycheck, stressed, full of anxiety. It's causing issues in the marriage, in the home. We humbly submit that to you as well. We pray that you would help us love one another well. Help us steward our finances well for your kingdom. It's a worthy investment for your glory. It is our chief end to glorify you and to enjoy you forever. And for the sake of generosity and leaving a legacy and inheritance to our children and to our children's children. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.